Tuesday, January 25th. Welcome to the Just Baseball Show. That's Jack McMullen and Aram Layton, and I am Peter Apple. We had a crazy NFL weekend that we haven't all gotten to speak about yet, but it is Mariners week. We're playing general manager with the Seattle Mariners today. Bills Chiefs, though, before we continue, was it the greatest game we've ever seen in the NFL? Jack, you said that on Twitter. Yeah, I said it's it's the best game I've ever seen, and it's not close. Granted, I'm 23 years old, and yeah. I you know watch the NFL at a pedestrian pace. So, like, I I think I tune into the best games. Like Javier Reyes brought up a good point. He said um, Rams Chiefs in Mexico City a couple of years ago gave off those vibes. Like, oh, best game I've ever seen. Yeah. But yesterday, I, it was 25 points in the last minute 52 of regulation. Yep. Like that's stupid. I was I was thinking about this arm. I'd rather have Tom Brady with two minutes to go down a touchdown. But if you're down 30 seconds, give me Patrick Mahomes over any quarterback. He got within field goal range in 13 seconds. Have you ever seen that before? No, no, that that's that's something I've absolutely never seen. And the, the weirdest thing to me though, dude, is like I feel like it is, I, and I understand like defense giving cushion and everything, but 13 seconds, that should never happen ever, 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 ever to be able to drive down the field and, and get a field goal like that. But I always feel like at the end of a ball game, offensive sliders get bumped up to 99 across the board and just offense becomes so easy. And yeah. I get it. They're, they're, they're giving cushion, but like, why, if it's that easy, why not just play regular defense? And it's never that easy. Uh, that's the part that always blows my mind. But that part aside, um, other than, the Greg Camarillo overtime touchdown for the O and 13 Dolphins. I think it was 0 and 15 Dolphins. You lost me. Game, uh, to beat the Ravens. Jack. That was listen, the best game I've ever That played. was the 0 and 15 Dolphins. No one remembers that game. Can you say that name one more time? Greg Camarillo. Greg Camarillo caught it and just got lost over the middle and touchdown. Dolphins won a game. Jason Taylor mob in the field. Yeah, that was one of the best football games I've been to in overtime. Uh, but I'll take this one over that. And this Bills Chiefs game went into overtime, and the overtime rules in the NFL are so stupid compared to the MLB rules. I mean, it's, I know everyone has seen this quote all over Twitter. It's like someone hits a walk off home run in the top of the tenth inning, and yeah. in the bottom half, the home team doesn't even get to defend themselves. It's kind of similar to when we knew when that coin toss was flipped whoever had the right call was going to win that football game. The chiefs ended up with the ball to start the overtime period and they ended up winning it. And on a touchdown from Patrick Mahomes, I mean, it's not that hard. It's the chiefs, but if Josh Allen had another opportunity to do so, he probably would have continued. And that game might've gone on for three, four more hours. If it was just touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. I don't know who would have won. I'm pro college overtime rule. I, I really am like, I, I don't like the two point conversion bullshit that they started doing this year when you've oh. got like nine overtimes with Penn state, Illinois, like, but the old one where, you know, you start at the opposing 25 yard line, give me your best shot. Other team has a chance to respond here. Um, I like that. And after two overtimes, you have to go for two. If you score a touchdown, I love that. Like that or, is big time or just give the other team a chance to match it. Right. Like you could do college OT, but regular football, like kick it back off to the bills and give them a shot and see what happens. Like even that, in my opinion, is, is an upgrade over what we're seeing right now, because it's, it's just, I don't like the idea of forcing overtime and then you could easily just not even get a chance to touch the football on the offensive side of things. I don't really think there's a parallel to that in sports in any other way. Uh, there's no other similar type of example where you see that and I think the baseball metaphor is, is the best because that's the only other sport where you're on offense slash defense and it's not like is fluid where it's like soccer you give the ball back you get it back same with basketball right. like if baseball has that cut and dry I think football should too and that's something they got to figure out and don't forget it used to just be field goal you kick the field goal the game was over yeah. that was the craziest shit ever like that was horrible so at least it's a little bit better but yeah they, they still they got to fix that I think they will and just finishing up the recap on the NFL weekend, the Chiefs were the only favorites to win. The Bengals beat the Titans. The 49ers beat the Packers. And like I said, the best team in football, the Los Angeles Rams, beat the greatest of all time in Tom Brady. It's a crazy football weekend, but really, really exciting, which was good. But what's more exciting 
what's more exciting, boys, is the Seattle Mariners, to us at least, because we're the Just Baseball show. So I'm excited to play general manager with you guys. Any any just quick words before I get into a little bit of introduction about who the Seattle Mariners truly were in 2021? They're good. Like they have a chance to be really, really good in 2022. They they missed the boat by a game. Obviously, it went down to the last game of the regular season, and they did it. I think two years before their window should have opened, and now I'm bumping their window up a year. Like there is a world where they are a World Series contender this year. Yeah. What about I mean, you? Fun differential. I, I'm liking it. I, I think they've got a shot this year to, to do some fun things. I, I could also see it going the other way though, too. So <laughs> this is one of those teams where I, I think there's a wide range of outcomes. And I think that's why they're so fun to talk about. They are fun to talk about. So let's start at the beginning on April 1st, the Mariners opened up the 2021 season with a 72 and a half win projection. Seattle crushed that puny projection finishing with a 90 and 72 record, just two games out of the second wild card spot. This team finished with a negative 51 run differential, but the fun differential was off the charts. So were they lucky or were they good? They were both. Ty France and Chris Flexen took huge steps forward, but Kyle Lewis didn't really, and Jared Kelnick struggled in his rookie campaign. They traded away Kendall Graveman at the trade deadline, and all hope seemed to be lost in Seattle, even though the team was still eight games over 500 at the time. They went 36 and 24 after the trade deadline, slingshotting themselves into playoff contention and right into the veins of baseball fans everywhere. Fangraphs rated this 2021 Mariners offense as the clutchest of all time. Seattle was America's team in 2021, but can they be world champions in 2022? That's what we are here to answer, boys. Straight away. Straight away, we got a lot, a lot of moves to make. We're going over free agency stuff. We're going over trades that they can make this offseason while also just going over what happened in 2021. So let's get into it, boys. Jack, I'm throwing it over to you with your handy-dandy whiteboard. Yeah, so I'm kind of a hipster. I've got an orange background with a plain black long sleeve T-shirt, and I've got an iPad that I take notes on with an Apple Pencil. So am I... Am I Jobs? Am I Steve Jobs? I was just about to say, a young Steve Jobs with his whiteboard. Yeah, what did I, Steve Jobs have back then? Like a, oh well, he didn't have the iPad. He, made he didn't the have iPad. the iPad. Steve Jobs was the iPad. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. So here's what I got. I got position players on one uh, note sheet with prospects. There, I've got pitchers, both the starting rotation and the bullpen with prospects. There, I've also got some additions that I want to make, but. Let's run through like we have in the last couple of weeks, just like what they have right now, a depth chart. Do we want to start on the mound or do we want to start with the bats? Let's start with the bats. Okay. Uh, Catching position. Tom Murphy is pretty much the everyday catcher right now. Cal Raleigh is pretty solid. I like Cal Raleigh. And then Luis Torrens is a third option here. Aram, what do you think about the catcher uh, position here? Yeah, I mean, Riley struggled, but I, I still like him. I still think he can figure it out. I, I like the bat. He's fine defensively. Uh, Torrens, the big question is is the the defense, but that's another iron in the fire. And then, like you said, they, they've got at least three guys that I think are all borderline regulars that could kind of take it to another level. I think they're more than fine at the catching spot. Pete? Yeah, I mean, they're all right at the catcher spot. I mean, just overall, before we just get into this offense, they finished 22nd in run scored in 2021. They finished last in batting average. They finished fifth lowest in war among position players and 27th in OPS. So the numbers didn't look great, but like I said, Fangraphs rated this offense as the clutchest of all time, according to their clutch metric. Um, So at catcher, I would say they're around major league average right now. You, Arm, you'd say Cal Rally, you think he can be above major league average in 2022? Or I think he can, man. Like it was a bad year for him. I don't think there's any way around it. But I mean, the guy can really swing it from both sides of the plate. I, I think he just really was in his own head. It was it was one of those things where it just seemed like every rookie that came up kind of struggled out of the gate. Uh, I, I still think Rally will figure it out. It was only 148 plate appearances and. I guess we know it, it takes a lot for guys to, to get acclimated up there, but what he did in triple a was crazy. 324, 377, 608. Wow. That hit for power from both sides. I, I think he's going to, he's going to be okay. And I love the swing uh, and the, the defense there is, is already at least average, you know? So I think at least in a complimentary role, he should be fine. 
So, so former Mariner bias here, but do you see a little bit of Mike Zanino in the pop department? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I think he's got a little bit more consistency in terms of like bat to ball, but he, he can run to baseball. I don't know if he has quite the ability to impact it like Zanino. I think he's yeah, more like, like 30 bombs. Yes. And he has got some crazy juice, but I mean, he did hit 22 jacks. I know actually, excuse me, 29 jacks back in 2019. I think most of those came in high a, but like this guy can really, really swing it through the minor leagues. He showed that he can. And I, again, as a switch hitter, he's not getting blown up on either side of the plate. I think it was just a, it was just a tough transition for him, but I think he's going to start to feel it out. Zanino had like a hilarious amount of swing and miss when he was in Seattle. I, I thought it was very funny watching Mike Zanino just like not make contact with anything when he no, was a Seattle Mariner. Like he was closing his eyes. Yeah, it was bad. First base, Terenz can fill in there, but for the most part, it's commandeered by Ty France, who is awesome. And then awesome. Evan White, who is <laughs> Evan White. Uh, yeah, he glove first, first baseman. <laughs> Love those guys. Glove first. I mean, the glove is phenomenal but the thing is ty france could have won a gold glove at first base with his defense this year like i don't think there's any need for evan white i wonder if evan white could go play an outfield position but even if we move him to the outfield can he hit at all i mean what's right. i guess what's the point like is his bat mlb worthy is the big no I, I don't see anything do you arm no but like you got to find out right like you got to give him a little bit more how about they like, like, he's found out a shot <laughs> I, he might get traded he might get traded honestly i mean i don't think there's much value there but I, we'll get into it like the mariners have a lot of and again like i i really feel bad using like metaphors or like words de to describe players but like they have fat to trim um and i hate using that in in a way to describe the team because that's human beings but like you look at like taylor trammell jake fraley like, there's not room for all of these guys you don't shit I, on trammell uh, or Fraley. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can okay. sit on Fraley. I'm fine. Put him right in front of the lineup, but my bad. But like you look at you look at that team, like there's a few guys across the board between beyond that too. You know, you're looking at White. Uh, those guys are probably complimentary pieces. How about Justice Sheffield? We'll get to him too. But like there's a lot of guys that are like okay enough, quadruple A type dudes or a little bit better that they could probably move. So uh yeah, White's probably just a depth piece right now at this point, right? I mean, it's, it's all he can really be. I'd like to give Aram a lot of credit for Ty France because I think even before Project the Plate was even an idea, before we even, you know, got on these phone calls to create just baseball, Aram was on Ty France <laughs> early and often. I was obnoxious and, about it. <laughs> and Aram, he's another one of these prospects that doesn't have a flashy tool. You know, he's not running super hard out of the box at crazy speeds. He's not hitting 450 foot home runs, but the guy just hits he just hits that's why we've coined the tie france effect of any prospect that fits that description that you just mentioned and uh yeah i think he's gonna keep doing it too i think we can pencil him in for that kind of production next year and it on a team that had the lowest batting average as a team say what you want about batting average it still matters in that sense of how many hits you get yes. in as many and as many at bats yes. they had the lowest at 226 but tie france 291 batting average this is a guy who could put bat to ball do you think he could win a batting title one day actually in today's game dude i think anyone can win a batting title seriously but i, I don't think he'll quite get there unfortunately anybody but mike zanino can win a batting title um <laughs> yeah. other corner infield spot is somewhere that they need to improve as of right now, Abraham Toro and Donovan Walton are the two options at third base, and I am saying nay to both of those in a heartbeat. Are you saying nay to Abraham Toro? I am. He's not on a World Series winner. He's not the starting third baseman. I guess there were some things to like. He at least had a he had a decent second half. He just had a really good August. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was around 100 WRC plus. He just didn't slug really at all. That's why his slugging percentage was down. His OPS was bad. But he was around league average last year, according to WRC plus. But yeah, I, I don't. I just don't think we should give up on Toro yet. I don't think he's that bad of a player. And he can provide a ton of defensive versatility across the field. I know he can play second. You can throw him in a quarter outfield as well, as well as third base. Um, I bet he could play first in a pinch yeah. um, if Evan White you know, whatever happens to him. And if Ty France, you know, plays DH, I'm sure he could get thrown over there too. So I, I wouldn't be so quick to just give up on Toro. Yeah, Toro is weird because I think in another situation he would make sense, but it's weird to me because 
the Mariners go get Adam Frazier, because I, I like Toro's bat more at second, I'd be more excited about the idea right. of him at second base. <laughs> right? That's Switch hilarious, there. though, to say. What? <laughs> then over Adam Frazier, considering what yeah. Adam Frazier just was. But, like, that's it is, it's got a fax, though. So I look at that infield, man, and I'm like, they need slugging from yeah. third base. You just talked about their offensive metrics, and the guy that was giving them a majority of that slug was Kyle Seeger. Now you're replacing Kyle Seeger with a bat to ball third baseman. And I just look across that infield. I'm like, they're not going to have a single 800 OPS guy outside of Ty France at first base who has, that's a prerequisite for first base. You have to have an 800 OPS. So I'm looking at the infield. I'm like JP Crawford glove first Frazier's bat to ball. And now at third base, you're giving up power too. like, you're going to have a lot riding on those outfielders. Those young outfielders to be able to produce. I, I, I want a big yes. stick at third. I, I kind of, that's a good point. I mean, you got to replace 35 home runs and a hundred RBIs on a team that, that, that was like the majority of their like slugging, yeah. like, you know, production. As it stands right now, you've got Frazier at second, JP Crawford at short and Dylan Moore as the third middle infielder here. So like this infield needs a facelift for sure. Yeah. Um, outfield probably does not because I'm looking at a five deep outfield right now without zero additions and discounting Julio Rodriguez, who is waiting in the wings here as Kyle Lewis, who comes back from a, from a meniscus tear, Jared Kelnick, Mitch Hanniger, who is a 900 OPS guy. Love Hanniger. Love, Love Hanniger. And then you've got Taylor Trammell and Jake Fraley as the two defensive options in the outfield too. Like they are really, really good in the outfield. They're really, really good in the outfield. Mitch Hanniger coming off 39 bombs, and he's 31 years old, and I was on his Instagram earlier today, and he he's working out like a fiend. I mean, he's grinding, and he feels like kind of – he is the face of the Mariners yeah. in a way. And Jared Kelnick is one of the best prospects in baseball. He was traded in the Robinson Cano deal, and he's surely going to have a good 2022. But I think the best outfielder – is not even on the team yet. Just like you said, Jack, I think Julio Rodriguez will be an all-star very soon and will be a perennial time all-star in his career. I think he's going to be an MVP winner. I think Julio Rodriguez is my personal, and I know on JustBaseball.com, we have Bobby Witt and Adley Rutschman and then Julio Rodriguez. Me personally, I like Julio at number one. Arm, what do you think? We'll see what the update looks like. Um, yeah. It's funny. I had a good conversation. The episode's coming out. Uh, it will actually be out by the time people are listening to this with uh, Baseball America's writer, uh, one of their writers, Jeff Ponce. And we spent more time than I thought we would on who number one is. It's splitting hairs, but they went Adley number one. And uh, it was a fun conversation about just that trio that I think people might enjoy for the call up on that podcast. But the, the, the other side of it, though, I look at center field. And that's the question. I love all their outfielders. I concur with everything you guys said, but who the hell is playing center field? Yeah. I mean, just, just for a little bit of perspective here, their center field situation last year, Jared Kalanick played 75 games out there, negative 6.4 defensive rating for fan graphs, negative 16 defensive runs saved. Very bad. Taylor Trammell, six or 36 games out there was about league average. Kyle Lewis, he can't play center anymore at this point, a catastrophic knee injury, a meniscus injury. I, I think it would be stretching him thin to put him out in center. And then Fraley is, is a guy that, you know, he's, he makes the flashy plays, but he's not a defensive center fielder. That's a big question. And, and you look at what Jerry DePoto said, he said, yeah, I think Kelnick's going to play some more center field. Uh, that's not a priority for us. I take that as posturing because at the end of the day, they were the ones calling up Pittsburgh and saying, what's the deal with Brian Reynolds. Uh, and they asked him price was Julio Rodriguez. So they hung up. Yeah, I think center field is a priority for them. Maybe it's not the utmost priority. I know they don't want to have Kalnick out there in center if they don't have to. And that's the big question is who's playing center field for this team next year? Because if it's Kalnick, as DePoto says, I mean, they're giving up a lot there in terms of defensive value in one of the most important places defensively in the entire field. <laughs> Just the thought of like Kyle Lewis in left and Kelnick in center and Julio in right and Hanniger is the DH is enough for me. Like I can, I can give some defense and center field there with, with that quartet being the three outfielders in the DH. Don't do you think Jared Kelnick's a good enough athlete to at least be able to make the move over to center and at right. least be major league average? I think I mean, he can get better. He can get better. And I feel like he hasn't played a lot of center field in his career, right? He's mostly been a corner who had to move over and kind of start taking reps in center field. 
Mostly you're shaking your head. Center in the minors. Oh, mostly played center in the minors and then came up and, and wasn't that good in center. You're saying, was he at least better in the minors when he played the position? He was okay. He's okay. Yeah. It's funny. I actually looked, I was like, I, I wonder how much he played in center, like going all the way back. He always played center. So here's the problem. I think he put on some weight. I think, but he, here's in a good here's, way though. It's like good way. Good way. Yeah. 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 Totally. But you know, no, he's just, he's just chubby now. Yeah. No, just yeah, like a many fat cheese guy it's, out there. Yeah, yeah. Too many cheese. <laughs> no. So the one thing I do think though, and I am a firm believer in this is I think he took some of those offensive struggles out there to center. Mm. Uh, I mean, we see that with young players all the time. I think he can get better. Yeah, obviously. So, I mean, if he gets better then yeah, you deal with it. Right. Because you're going to get so much offensive production out of there, but ugh, it was bad. They were the only team in major league baseball with a negative F war from center field last year. Uh, I know a lot of that was because Kelnick didn't hit. Uh, but I mean, a lot of that, most of that was the defensive struggles. So it, it should be interesting. It's hard to believe that Jake Fraley isn't a good defensive center fielder because I've never seen a man rob more home runs than Jake Fraley <laughs> does in Seattle. He's a magician. He is a magician. I mean, I think he's the best robber of home runs maybe in baseball. All right, so let's just jump right back in with the starting rotation here because they just signed Robbie Ray to five years, $115 million. He is like the number one of a 10 deep rotation or a 12 deep rotation. I mean, I'm looking at it right now. Opening day, the starting five probably looks like Ray, Marco Gonzalez, Chris, Chris Flexton, Logan Gilbert, and Justin Dunn. That's a good five. But then you've got, who's going to make their MLB debuts this year, George Kirby, Emerson Hancock, Matt Brash. And then you also have Brandon Williamson, who, Aram, I know you're really high on. And then I'm kind of still holding about like a teensy bit of hope on Justice Sheffield and then Nick Margavich is too. Like there are 11 MLB starters right now for the Mariners to choose from. And with Robbie Ray at the top five years, 115 million to those Seattle Mariners coming off an AL Cy Young award with the Toronto Blue Jays. But there's a lot of debate on whether Robbie Ray is actually good or not, whether he had kind of a lucky 2021 or if he's actually a good pitcher moving forward. I'm in the boat where I do think Robbie Ray is still an excellent pitcher in this league. Is he a top tier ace? Is he a top 10 pitcher in baseball? Probably not. But do I think that he learned something from Pete Walker, one of the best pitching coaches in baseball with the Toronto Blue Jays? Yes. Do I think that he could give you a 3-4 ERA with 230 strikeouts in over 200 innings? I also think that's the case. That's what I think we're going to see from Robbie Ray. So you hear all this slander about how Robbie Ray's peripherals weren't that great in 2021. So people are just automatically calling him a bad pitcher still. I'm on the boat. That's just not the case. He's still going to be a really good pitcher, maybe just not top 10. Would you agree with that, Arm? Yeah, totally. I mean, you look at the peripherals, I would argue that you can offset those peripherals with the fact that he's going from pitching in environments that were terrible, whether it was Dunedin or Buffalo, or then, you know, even at times Toronto, and then going to a place in Seattle, which is one of the more pitcher friendly ballparks in baseball. I think that'll offset some of those peripherals. So I'm not entirely concerned about him taking a huge step back. I think he'll take maybe a a small step back naturally. I mean, (laughs) the guy, the guy was one of the best pitchers in baseball last year. Uh, And I think the big strength for the Mariners is going to be that no matter what day it is of the week, they're going to have a good chance at a quality start. Uh, And I think that's just as important as having two studs at the top is that you're it, when it comes to a rotation, I think you're as good as your weakest link. Like, yeah, you have a guy every fifth day that can give you a win, but if you also have a guy every fifth day that puts you at a, at a hole every single game, then you're in trouble. And, and I think they're not going to have that issue because as Jack mentioned, every time one of these prospects or young pitchers goes down or falters or whatever, they've got another guy just waiting, just ready to go. It, it's outrageous. I've never seen anything like it. Here's the thing. Like I, I was just talking to you guys before we started recording. I mean, in August, like August 1 through 6, if we're looking at the Mariners' schedule right now and Robbie Ray has to miss three starts or something, like maybe he pulls a hammy and he's just like went, went down to the spring training complex, like stretching that bad boy out, using a Theragun on it, and, and he's going to be back in two weeks. I mean, you could put together a five-man rotation of Logan Gilbert, Justin Dunn, George Kirby, Emerson Hancock, and Matt Brash, and I'm going to want to tune into all five of those games without their ace on the mound absolutely i mean the the prospects are loaded this system is loaded with some of the best pitching prospects in baseball and i know arm could speak to that even more highly than me i mean they got because i was even thinking arm and and you know this is not an mlb the show simulation but 
in actuality, if the Mariners decided to do so, they could package some of the guys, some of the guys in the farm system. I don't think they'd have to even gut the entire thing for a guy like Juan Soto. So I don't exactly have a trade for Juan Soto, but just talk about these Mariners prospects because if we wanted to, we could actually pr- propose a fair trade for Juan Soto. Yeah, I mean, they could trade theoretically. I mean, I think they put together a package that nobody in baseball can match. Like that's that's the craziest thing. Is even unless you're trading from the big leagues, if you tra- put together a minor league package, there's not a team in baseball that could match what the Mariners can give you because pitching's a premium. Not only are these guys all high upside pitching prospects, they all saw Double A last year. Every single last one of those guys you just mentioned saw double A last year, some in varying amounts. And I mean, even Brandon Williamson, who's like the afterthought of this conversation is a guy that actually averaged 12 and a half Ks per nine innings in double A as a lefty. So I'm looking at this whole list and I'm like, yeah, you could at some point during the season trade from one of those guys and, and go get somebody or before that, which we'll talk about, but yeah, I mean, to Peter's point, the fact that they could actually put together a package that, based on market value, which whatever the hell market value would be for Juan Soto. Like if you put it in that godforsaken trade machine, they could match up the trade value, I think, with the prospects they have, which is just outrageous and, and kind of explains, you know, what they have going on there. And I know Peter, like someone, Peter, I think he tailed a decent amount last year. It was like Chris Flexen. Oh, like, yeah. That guy's not bad. Like that, no, that's a no. solid, solid rotation piece for you too. And, and it's not like he's 35 having a career like renaissance. He's still 27, I believe. So like they've got young guys up there too that, that are pretty solid. So I do really like Chris Flexen. Chris Flexen is another guy who outperformed his peripherals similar to um, a guy like Robbie Ray. I mean, if we just look at, for example, like FIP numbers and expected ERA numbers, I mean, he had a 361 ERA compared to a 389 FIP and a 4.30 expected ERA. He doesn't strike out that many guys, but he also doesn't walk that many hitters. His stuff isn't elite, but it's above average. I'm super interested to see to see what I'm going to see from Chris Flexen next year. Like if I gave you an ERA total of around three, six, zero, do you think he outperforms that? Or do you think he underperforms that Jack's going way over? Yeah. I like in a good like, way or wait, like lower than, no, three, I think he's like a three, nine guy. Oh, yeah. okay. Interesting. But like, that's fine. <laughs> it's yeah. fine. It, that's yeah. a five. Yeah, yeah. But maybe he is better than that. Maybe. Maybe he is better than that. Maybe he's a guy who can continue to outperform these peripherals. Here's the thing, though. With the talent that you have waiting in the wings in terms of starting pitching, I'm fine with Chris Flexen at a 3-9, and everything he gives me above that is gravy. Like, yeah. good. Let's keep running him out there until Kirby and Hancock are ready because Kirby and Hancock are just better than Chris Flexen. Like, objectively better pitchers than Chris Flexen here. Um I again, I do not condone trading for Juan Soto if you're the Seattle Mariners. I like this is my parental warning like, do not trade for Juan Soto. You've got enough here. But that's like, the, uh, what these, don't trade for Juan Soto. So if they don't did, trade like, for oh, Juan Soto, because <laughs> you got to gut the shit out of this thing. I mean, but here's the thing though like, if we're just hypothetical again, hypothetical, does Noel V. Marte, who's one of the best shortstop prospects in baseball right now, George Kirby and Emerson Hancock, that trio, get it done for Soto? No. Throwing Matt Brash, that's a trade. Maybe. I, I, I can't even answer that because I don't know what a trade for Juan Soto looks like. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Just throw like four of the best like prospects gonna, at baseball at him. You're going to have to gut your whole, like some of your top, top guys. And then you know what? You're not going to be able to pay him after. So it's like no. you know, what you're, you're gutting, you know, the future uh, for for a couple years of Soto. And I, 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 that's the problem is I don't want to give up that years. We're talking about five, six years of control with each of these guys for two years of Soto. Uh, that That's the struggle. Yeah. At so least now that you. Kevin Mather is out, old president and CEO of the Mariners, he's gone after after last year. They did commit more money to some of these guys. So maybe now with their payroll near seventy one million dollars, one of the lowest in baseball. New ownership, maybe they they think to themselves, you know what? Maybe we should give Juan Soto five hundred million dollars over fifteen years. <laughs> no, but yeah. that's not that's not actually going to happen. But talking about another guy in the starting rotation, Logan Gilbert, who, you know, his ERA was four six one, but his peripherals were much better. He looked actually like a much better pitcher than what his ERA said. He had a three seven three FIP and a four point oh nine expected ERA. 
Jack, would you rather have Logan Gilbert or Chris Flexen in your rotation? I'd Not rather that the have Mariners Logan have to choose. I'd rather just, have Logan Gilbert. You'd rather have Logan Gilbert? Yeah. Me too? Yeah. Yeah. I think Gilbert's got like number two upside, probably closer to a number three. Uh, but he figured it out down the stretch, had a really good final six starts of the season. The command's good. He's figured out a way to make the fastball play. I, I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be a really solid pitcher for them. And another guy that, I mean, he's, he's probably closer to the middle of the rotation, but I love, I love what he's got going on and, and a high floor guy that still has some upside. You think the Gucci is now gone. <laughs> That's something interesting, but they don't need him at all. But he's a guy who had a four four one ERA. It wasn't that great last year. Even his peripherals were even worse. Um, but, you know, they're losing him. Uh, I don't really have a point there. Just more like, you know, that's someone that they're losing. It's someone who's been a Mariner for a while now. Can we just note that you're big into the peripherals right now? I, I'm telling you again, get your head out of the Excel sheet. I'm Let, just, let's looking. Watch I'm some just talking. I'm looking. We're talking baseball. Just, you know, spare me. All right, let's talk about the bullpen here um, before we jump back into what they need to add hitting wise, because this bullpen is sneaky, kind of awesome. Yes. They've got I'm going to run through these guys real quick. Drew Steckenrider, former Miami Marlin. Aram can speak to him. Plus fastball. He's got a mess slider, but he's got a good change up too. Casey Sadler, who is cutter dominant, but a stupid curveball. That thing is nasty. Paul Seawald, who had a 40% K rate, a 7% walk rate in a sub one whip, who was pretty awesome. Diego Castillo, who had a sub one whip in 58 innings this year across his time with Tampa and Seattle. Andres Munoz is coming back from injury. Munoz sits 100 with his fastball. And then Ken Giles is coming back from injury. And Ken Giles, not too long ago, was like the best slider pitcher out of the bullpen in baseball. I mean, they've got serious depth here. Problem is, they're all right-handed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want they, to add a lefty. The craziest part is, you know, we just talked about, uh, I was just talking about the Padres prospects. Uh, Ray Kerr, the guy that they actually sent over to San Diego uh, in that Adam Frazier deal is a lefty who throws a hundred with a wipeout breaking ball that would have fit really nicely in there. So the fact that they were really willing to trade Ray Kerr, who I think, you know, will be in the big leagues right away for the Padres, it tells me that they've got something up their sleeves, whether they're going to, you know, sign a free agent. There's still so many free agent lefties out there so uh, or, or, you know, maybe going to just make another upper minor league level trade. I think they'll satisfy that part. But Munoz is someone that doesn't get enough attention, came over in that trade from the Padres uh, in, in with Ty France. And, and Munoz is somebody that, uh, they really believe in. I think they gave him a four-year deal off of an injury where he only threw two-thirds of an inning last year. He, he's going to be a legit dude. I wouldn't be shocked if he's the closer in a couple of years for them. And Anthony Misevich is another lefty in their pen who threw 54 innings. He was pretty good, not great, but solid. And I feel like he'll at least contribute as a left-handed reliever. But I agree, Jack. They There's an arm. There's plenty of free agents out there. And you're already, you're already gritting there because you know a couple of lefty free agents that they should go grab. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go least sexy to most sexy names. And sexy doesn't mean best fit. I think sexy just means like it's gonna produce the most intense reaction from you guys. So I'm gonna go. You know, most subdued reaction to most like "fuck you, get out of my face" or "let's do it" reaction. Cool. All right. Let's start at the bottom with Daniel Norris. Are you interested in Daniel Norris at all? Didn't Daniel Norris live in a van? Yes. Not particularly. No, I'm not interested in Daniel Norris that much. Okay, fair. Not He's because of the van thing. Out. It sounds like because of the van. No, not because of the van thing. Just you know, connecting dots like in my brain. He lives. Yeah, so. no, it, it sounds like you don't like the van thing. All right, moving Honestly, on. Jake, Jake, not Deakman. anti-van. <laughs> Are you anti Jake Deakman? No, not even a little bit. No, Jake Deakman. Yes, I like that name. Arm, you look anti Jake Deakman. I, like sure. Okay, a little bit more sexy reaction here. Brad Hand. No pretty bad last year man but like okay. I, he's not this guy but but this isn't like an important role like this is just the lefty for them so yeah exactly. i'm in on i'm in on hand hand's gonna Sounds be like bad. weirdly expensive though i feel like still maybe just because the he name is, value then, then he can kick rocks but if he knows yeah. that he's not worth that much anymore then yeah i'm in all right how about andrew chafin yes much better Sign me perfect up. yeah perfect veteran lefty mustache Give it to me. Now my pick. All right. Oh, I, know, I know who this is. Andrew Miller. Yeah. No. No. Thank you. He's so yeah, give washed. him to me. Give him to me. 
what do you want from Andrew Miller anymore? 89 with just the slider they know that's coming that he can't throw for a strike anymore? Yeah, I want Miller in hopes of wringing the last bit out of the towel. I also want him for this insane veteran presence that is needed on this team because we talk about how much young talent there is here. Where's the veteran presence now that Kyle Seeger's gone? I'd rather have Jake Diekman than Andrew Miller. But Miller has won things. Diekman has never won anything. Has Chafin won things? Chafin's won things. No, not really. I don't think he's won anything. (laughs) Andrew Miller was the guy on a team that was like an inning away from going to the World Series or from winning the World Series. But does a back-end reliever who's not going to contribute much on the field, is he that winning guy that will propel the Mariners? Donis Haslam. Yeah, <laughs> Udonis Haslam. That's what I'm saying. You ha- you don't need to sign right. much. Like go so sign you Udonis, Udonis Haslam, Haslam and, and pitch to lefties a little bit. But I'm I see not what... looking for Bam out of bio. I'm I... looking for Udonis Haslam. I see what you're saying, Jack, because and that's just to point out how good this Mariners bullpen is currently. I mean, you've named all the guys. I think um, according to F Ward, they were the sixth best bullpen in baseball. According to that stat, they were a really good bullpen. So they just need a little bit of tinkering here and there so i understand what you're saying with the with the veteran presence with andrew miller but i just feel like there's plenty of other guys that provide that same presence maybe they haven't won championships but they still can provide that spark that they need so we agree that chafin is option one and then everybody else can go kick sand i think jake deekman's a good option i like that one i don't know why we're i don't know why we're throwing that one to the weight side well i think daniel norris is a good option because i like the van thing peter all right well good for you i like the van thing too that's All right. not why Let, I'm anti doors. <laughs> Let's transition back to the bats. And I just have one quick question for you guys, because Seattle going into 2022 is one of nine teams with north of $100 million of luxury tax base to work with. They've got 106, if I'm not mistaken, million dollars to work with before they hit the penalty. They're not going to get anywhere close to that. But are you team trade or are you team buy? Start with Aram. I mean, obviously the answer is always buy if, if, if it's about the money for them and like they, they're okay spending a little bit more. Um, I know I look at third base and it, it's a challenge, right, to, to address that position outside of Matt Chapman. And if we're talking about attainable, realistic trades, how many other third base candidates are there really out there? Josh Donaldson. You? Josh Donaldson's a potential guy as well, but I think the Twins may actually try to try to keep him and just see what happens this year. Yeah, why? Um, but I, if it's not Donaldson or Chapman, I, I think you got to go and make a signing, which I'm not going to steal your thunder, Jack, because I know, I know who you want to, to, for them to go sign. Uh, but I, I think that makes the most sense probably is go make a signing if, if, you can't, if you can't go get Matt Chapman. I marvel at the thought of just Matt Chapman and J.P. Crawford on the left side of an infield together. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. And I think Chapman would give you very similar type of production to what you got from Seager last year, which is low batting average, a lot of power, uh, but with better defense. And I think probably a little bit more room offensively to, to produce. Pete, are you team buy or team trade? I'm team buy. Uh, you look at the payroll and I know that, you know, they're not a team that has a propensity to spend a bunch of money, but can you finally once you see the team at 90 and 72 with the farm system that they're cooking up, is it finally time to sign that big free agent? And Jack, I'm teeing you up right now because you, I know Mariners fans are probably clamoring for a Jose Ramirez trade proposal and the Mariners could do it, but we've spoken about this before. We don't think the guardians will sell and we kind of don't think that they should sell either. So I, I know we were joking around about Juan Soto trade rumors, and I'm sure we could just throw out random rumor mill trades because you know I love to do that. Just out of nowhere, just get the rumor mill cooking. I like the hot stove. But it doesn't – I don't think that the Mariners would get Jose Ramirez, so I just – I don't think it's worth going over. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, I, I like the Chapman idea for trading. I'll, I'll get to the signing in a moment. I, I like the Chapman idea if you're going to go trade. I want to throw another name to you in the trade market that I think is probably worth a little bit less than Chapman, who can also be good here, and that's Jamer Candelario. Does that name do anything for you guys? Candelario is a 119 WRC plus guy. He's got two more years of control. He had a 3.2 war. No, I love him. I just don't think he's available. 
Yeah, he's an extra base hit guy in Detroit where the park is huge. I wonder if he went to a better ballpark, if, it, if some of those doubles could end up being home runs. I think they're trying to win. Yeah, I agree. I don't think they're going to do it, but I think they're trying. So I think Candelaria, I love him. I, I would love that as a fit. Me too. I just don't think the Tigers would do it. Are they Are they entirely, Detroit, are they entirely gone on Isak Paredes? I don't love him. I don't love him. Do they? Because they did. I don't think they love him that much. Peter, do you like Isak Paredes at all? Not particularly. What if they want Torque to play third base? Like, do you keep Candelario? I don't. Are they going to want Spencer Torkelson to play third? They want him to play third. Yeah, they want. Yeah, I want to fly too, but like, it's just <laughs> not an option. Um, I think he's stuck at first, personally. Yeah, I hear you. All right, I think the Seattle Mariners should go sign Chris Bryant. Yep, I really do. Chris Bryant is a Swiss Army knife. If you need somebody to play center, chances are. Chris Bryant is going to be your best option in center field. If Kelnick is playing poorly, Chris Bryant has played solid center for the San Francisco Giants down the stretch. Chris Bryant immediately solves your problem at third base. This guy had a 123 WRC plus last year. I mean, he had what? 36 war hit 265 with a 353 OBP. This guy is durable as shit too. I mean, I'm looking back to 2015, his rookie year, his game totals. 151, 155, 151, 102 in 2018 was an outlier. He was dealing with some stuff then. 2019, back to 147. And then in 2021, 144 games. He's going to play all the time for you. He's striking out a lot less than he ever has. He's walking near a career high clip. I mean, Chris Bryant is your better batting average, same amount of power, can be a run producer, and defensive versatility. And you know what? I know he's a Boris guy. I know it's Chris Bryant. I don't think he's going to be that expensive. I think you're handing out another Robbie Ray deal. Mm -hmm. And we can clean up, say that's it. Mariners are one of my World Series favorites. I have a question for the both of you. We've done a lot of this GM's episode. You know, we've done the Padres, the Reds, um, other teams. Now I'm forgetting. Is, has there been a better free agency fit than Chris Bryant to the Mariners that we've talked about? I think it's like a glove how good of a fit Chris Bryant fits with well, the Mariners. Oh, I totally agree. And I, to answer your question, no, I don't, I don't think there is a better fit because literally like you have someone now that actually could play center in a pinch too, which is it's just crazy. Uh, but being able to play all over the diamond, the versatility was something that Topoto really wanted when – they were looking at him in the trade deadline. Uh, the, the Mariners were reportedly the team that was the closest to getting him uh, besides the Giants. And, uh, you know, I think that says a lot. I think that sh kind of shows you that the interest is there. And, and I bet they make an offer. I bet they I bet they make an offer. I don't know if that's going to be the best offer, but I bet they do. And uh, I, I think that changes everything for them. Their lineup instantly becomes better uh, there. They have that versatility. And yeah, it's an upgrade over Seager from last year. And so your, your lineup's getting better in other ways naturally. And now you upgraded third base. This would change a lot. Just one move, I think, could make move the needle a lot for this team. You've got that World Series winning presence, too. I mean, we talk about veteran presence. You screw the Andrew Miller thing. Yeah, like, you, don't Chris Miller that. <laughs> you don't need Miller. He signed Chris Bryant. Andrew Miller immediately becomes expendable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's not even on the team yet, and he's expendable. <laughs> you just get one other guy who's won a World Series title. Well, now why why even sign Andrew Miller? Uh, I don't think you have to. It's one or the other. <laughs> yes, it's, it's one or the other. <laughs> what what if that was like, ah, oh, shit, we just signed Andrew Miller. We can't sign no, Chris Bryant we're not, now. We're not interested. DePoto <laughs> comes out with that report to Mariners fans. Could you imagine? Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, they'd kill him. They'd tell him he's playing fantasy baseball again. And it's funny just going back to the starting rotation because we didn't really add anything over trades or, you know, through free agency. And yet this team finished with the 16th best ERA in baseball as a staff, but they're just so freaking loaded. I don't, do we have to do anything to the starting rotation? I would think maybe you add a fifth starter because I mean, how good actually is Justin Dunn, but no, I, I give Justin Dunn a chance, you know, I think Dunn's a better, I mean, like, think about it. You can go, as I click back to my starting pitcher sheet on the iPad here, I, I mean, like, in reality, you can have Ray, Gonzalez, Flexen, Gilbert, Dunn, Kirby, Hancock, and Brash. That's nine guys. 
Does any rotation in baseball, is there anything deeper? Any team that has more than nine of those kind of guys in all of baseball? I don't think so. So it's not the best. Like there, there is not, Robbie Ray is the worst of the aces. I think like I'm yeah. still kind of a Robbie Ray hater because I got to see him do it again. But like Robbie Ray is the worst of the elite pitchers, Cy Young caliber. Like I'm taking Robbie Ray last in the fantasy draft of Cy Young caliber pitchers. But like if Ray does it again, boom, you've got your ace. And then you've got so many pieces that could be phenomenal. Like the, the potential to be phenomenal is through the roof here. So like, yes, not the best staff in the division in the American League by any stretch. But I think in two years, we could be having the conversation that the Mariners have one of the best staffs in baseball because that is how good the prospects are. Can we do something really fun? Yeah. Can we rank like Flexen and Gilbert and Brash and Kirby and yeah. Hancock and just kind of see where they stack up against their prospects? And I mean, Arm, you're, you're the perfect person to throw that to first. You know, you got, I mean, let's just go through them again quickly. George Kirby. Emerson Hancock, Matt Brash, Brennan Williamson, Logan Gilbert, and Chris Flexen. Am I missing any? Throw Justin Dunn in there too. I think Justin Dunn would be last, but that's just me in that ranking. Like next year? No, just like I guess the pitchers that you like the most moving forward. Maybe not just 2022 because these guys are rookies. But I to give, I guess us and Mariners fans and anyone else listening kind of to see where their prospects rank up with their current MLB talent. Yeah. All right. All right. I've got seven. Yeah. What a question that is. I know what a loaded question, but it's a I'm fun one. And Kirby, I feel like it's important. Kirby. Kirby. Number one. Brash. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Brash. Then. Mm, Gilbert is Gilbert uh. in here. Yeah. Gilbert or Hancock? Oof. I'll go Hancock, Williamson. So, so. Wait, you went Gilbert so three. Gilbert's three and Hancock's no. four? Oh, oh no. wait, no. Gilbert's, Gilbert's not, not even off the yet. board yet. <laughs> Williamson, Gilbert. Wow. Then I'm going to go Justin Dunn, then Flexen. Did I miss like, somebody? You like Dunn better than Flexen? Yeah. If he's healthy, I, I like Dunn better than Flexen. That makes me so sad. Not, I mean, just because I trust you on that. And I love Chris Flexen and I, and I watch both of them. And I just, I, I think I see Chris Flexen as a better pitcher. But, you know, maybe Justin Dunn can be better. I don't know. I guess, you know, sometimes my betting gets in the way. Because I'm just yeah. tailing Chris Flexen when he's undervalued, according to Vegas, and he just continues to win game in and game out. I'm like, what are you missing here? Same thing with Cal Quantrill of the Guardians. Just yeah, they they just win. They just figure out ways to put their teams in positions to win the ball game. I, yeah, I, I think Flexen and Don are the biggest toss up in the world, personally. <sighs> yeah, That's fair, I guess. All right, I've got Kirby one, Hancock two, Gilbert three. Brash four, Williamson five, Dunn six, Flexen seven. Flexen seven. <laughs> Dude, but who's he better than here? on that list? I think I think Flexen is better than Dunn. Um, I guess I would still put Chris Flexen above Brendan Williamson, but maybe that's just me. So let me do mine. So I would go George Kirby one. I would go Brash two. I would go Hancock three. I would go Gilbert four. Flexen five. Williamson six. Dunn seven. Nick Margavich is eight. <laughs> Nick Margavich is eight. 88 with the fastball but from the what left that side. Should Good change go, up, though. What that should go to show is that although Logan Gilbert and Chris Flexen have already made their MLB impact and have ar- and already look at least at the bottom between a two or a four in a good rotation, you have three, four, five guys waiting that are all arguably better. This is what the Seattle Mariners have to look forward to in 2022 and beyond. Do you think any of those guys are going to make an impact in 2022? Not just pitch, but make a legitimate impact and who's going to be those, those guys. 
all of them with the exception of Williamson. Yeah. Really? I think Williamson's the one that threw the most innings in double A last year, ironically. Um, and, and I think could come in into some sort of lefty reliever role down the stretch, worst case scenario. I think Hancock is the least likely to, to chip in next year. I think he's the furthest away um, and, and still will get pulverized if he gets called up too early. Uh, the fastball just isn't there yet. Uh, Brash could be in a big league bullpen right now. They were talking about calling him up at the end of the year last year. Kirby has 75 grade, 80 grade command of a fastball that's 99 miles per hour. Kirby's the, the guy that's going to help the most, I think, right away, as long as he's healthy. Then I'd probably go Brash in some sort of, of way, however he's uh, you know deployed out there. Those two guys, I think, are one and two in terms of who's going to help. Okay, so when Kirby comes up, I think Kirby immediately enters the Alec Manoa conversation where we're talking about like best young pitcher in baseball. Mm. Who does George Kirby remind you guys of currently? Does he, re- cause he doesn't really remind me of Alec Manoa, but I think what you were saying, Jack is not that he reminds you of Alec Manoa, but that he can provide that type of impact once he comes up to the big leagues. Yeah. And people are going to watch him and like, not be able to see enough George Kirby. Like George Kirby is going to be, he's going to be like the top pitching vote getter for rookie of the year. Either does George, league. Does George Kirby remind you a little bit of Zach Wheeler, perchance? A little bit, but the command's better. Like, we haven't seen command from a prospect like this. Um, can you tell the story of George Kirby? Because George Kirby is, is not a guy who, when drafted, was this immediate can't-miss pitching prospect. But then he just started throwing harder and harder and he and the location the command never left but he just started getting it up there from 90 to 92 and now he's throwing 99 miles an hour the story of kirby is honestly kind of incredible arm one quick thing before you answer this about kirby i do just want to point out his junior year at elon when he went in the first round 88 in the third innings 107 punch outs six walks Dude. 107 to six his junior year at elon so he always had the command but how is the stuff uh, progressed. Yeah. I mean, the, the command is, is outrageous. And that was like kind of what got him into the Cape. You know, he was, he was a closer for the most part in the Cape, which is wild too, where uh, out there, 24 Ks, one walk. Uh, so it was the same trend throughout, throughout that entire collegiate career, but then he gets to, to Seattle or not necessarily Seattle, but he gets to their organization and uh, starts throwing 98, 99, and then up to hundred. And so the command didn't go to the wayside though. So you had the same elite command with 98, 99 mile an hour fastballs. The big issue with him, and not even issue, it's just the one question, is the quality of the secondaries. But he commands them well. He's starting to show a better feel for the changeup. The curveball and slider are good enough. I mean, when you have the baseline of that fastball, it's it's pretty easy to at least be decent. (laughs) So I think, you know, he's in great shape. But his story, too, I mean, is not really the most recruited guy in the world. Had a pretty iffy freshman year. Uh, and then just really put it together beyond that. And it, it took a team like the Mariners to see him and say, okay, we can develop this guy. And this is yet another dude where it's, it's, you have the pitch ability and then you take the stuff to the next level. And that's exactly what they did with Kirby. I think the secondary stuff's going to keep getting better and better. The, the, this guy's got such a high floor without the compromising of his ceiling. It's so exciting. So what do you guys, what do you guys think about my Zach Wheeler comparison to George Kirby a little bit? Yeah, I'm telling you, better command. <laughs> like, he, wow. I, I don't think that's bad at all, though. No, in it's it's pretty profile. solid. Um, hey, hey, real quick, Aram, you and I have a mutual friend, Tim Leonard, who does great college basketball stuff. But Tim was my partner out on the Cape with the Brewster Whitecaps calling games. And the there were two players out there that fully captivated our attention. Like, this is a major league baseball player. Like, we took the headset off between innings and we're like, oh, my God, what just happened? Spencer Torkelson hit two of the loudest home runs that I've ever seen uh, and ever heard. And then George Kirby closed a game out uh, in Brewster. We ended the broadcast, took the headsets off, and Tim turned to me and was like, that's a major league baseball pitcher if I've ever seen one. Yeah. Like, and this was before a hundred, like Kirby just, he looked the part. I was like, Oh my God, this guy is so freaking good at baseball. Yeah. I mean, that's the best way to sum it up. And, and I think he's continued to back that up uh, throughout the minor leagues. If the secondaries just are even 
uh, above average, he's he's in business. I mean, I was watching his starts. The way he can put the fastball on either side of the plate, the way he commands it, he's going to be damn good. And I think he's he's pretty much close to ready. Uh, even without the secondaries being big league caliber, he'll, he'll be able to be successful with that heater. And Matt Brash looks like Freddie Peralta with the fastball slider combo. I mean, he's another guy who could be an ace potentially in this league, and not enough people are talking about Matt Brash. No, and and Brash is a guy we talked about way back, right? And I mean, yeah. that that breaking ball, it's like a power curve, slurvy type pitch. It's disgusting. It's going to have that same kind of Freddie Peralta ridiculous numbers. The fastball is insane, and he needs to find a feel for the changeup, but has shown some some ability at times. But like Peralta, he doesn't need Peralta doesn't need the third pitch really that often. He just needs to sprinkle it in rarely to really take himself to, to where he needs to be consistency wise. I think Brash is is right in that same boat. And I think he can do the same type of thing uh, right out of the gate. I think he can be that dominant uh, as long as he throws strikes. And, and I thought the command got better as the year went on. Okay. One more question on the Mariners. If they make zero additions, no Chris Bryant, no anybody. And Pakoda sets their win projection at 90. Are you taking oh. the over or under? Under. That's just under. lofty. If they don't, if they don't do anything else, like they need to address this offense. They need to address their base. Like I said, I like Toro, but I agree with you guys that if you guys want to win 90 games and be a perennial, you know, wild card team, playoff team, like this, this infield as currently constructed, I don't think is going to do it. And you're relying a lot on the Julio Rodriguez is of the world who I love, but a lot of these young guys to make their leaps immediately when maybe it might take them a year. That's why the Chris Bryant signing has to happen because that changes the fabric of this team, not only from just a third base, not only from a slugging profile, but just because you said it before his, his Swiss army knife abilities, the fact that he can go play center, he can fill in the holes that the Mariners have um, and you're filling it in with Chris Bryant. So I, I would go under. If they if they add Chris Bryant, give me a win total. You first, Pete. You can go first there. All right, <laughs> just just KB. If they just add KB and Chafin, and Chafin, and I'd put it right at ninety. Yeah, I'd put it right at ninety. I think ninety, give or take a couple, and that that could be what puts them in or takes them out. I, I think you know, at the end of the day, they are forced to rely on the young guys. And, and as Peter said, I mean, if, if you can hedge some of that uh, and take a little bit of that off of those young guys, that's important. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to rely on some young pitchers. You're going to have to rely on some young outfielders and, you know, that can go any, any which way. And I, and I think that's a really important thing to, to monitor is, I mean, if, if Julio struggles a little bit, or if Kalnick doesn't quite parlay that fa fantastic final month, if Kyle Lewis is, is just not quite healthy, uh, there, there's a lot to be to be answered there, but on the flip side, those guys look like they're taking the steps in the right direction. They look like they're they're in a good spot. You're adding Julio to this team. You're adding Kyle Lewis to this team, who barely played last year and was the rookie of the year. So there's a lot of reason to be optimistic as well, is because even if he's just DHing, you're getting a big bat in Kyle Lewis back in the fold there for you. Uh, I think 90 wins is attainable uh, because I think they overperformed in some ways last year, uh, and you know the clutch thing. I think that that has a little bit of luck built in. Right. So you, you got to kind of find that balance. And I don't think you can come up big every single time in a, in a clutch situation and, and count on that. So I think they're going to get better and be right around the same spot where they were last year in terms of wins. I think they're an 85 ish, 86 win team without adding KB or Chafin. But let's go over the roster again with all those completions in there, what we think the 2022 Mariners roster should look like with our additions. And then I'll tell you whether I think they could win 90 games. Okay. So catcher Murphy, Raleigh, and Terence. Solid. First, France and Evan White. Second, Adam Frazier and Dylan Moore. Short, J.P. Crawford with Dylan Moore as the filler. Third, Chris Bryant, Abraham Toro. Left, Kyle Lewis, let's say. Center, Jared Kelnick, let's say, with Jake Fraley as the backup. Right, Mitch Haniger, Taylor Trammell as the fifth outfielder, if you're counting Fraley as the fourth. Starting pitching, Robbie Ray, Marco Gonzalez, Chris Flexen, Logan Gilbert, Justin Dunn, with George Kirby, Emerson Hancock, Matt Brash, Justice Sheffield, Brandon Williamson waiting in the wings. The bullpen, Andrew Chafin, who we're adding, Drew Steckenrider, Casey Stadler, 
Paul Seawald, Diego Castillo, Andres Munoz, Ken Giles. That's a great bullpen. That's a great bullpen. That's a great that team. team. That yeah. team. That team wins ninety games. Twenty twenty three, they might win one hundred and sixty two games. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Seriously, Julio, like twenty twenty three is going to be insane for the Seattle Mariners. Totally, but twenty twenty two, I totally, like, I totally left out Julio. And we left out Julio Rodriguez. No, exactly. I thought you left out Julio on purpose. No, just to I mean, say like what twenty twenty three is going to look like. Yeah, like Julio's going to be there. <laughs> Yeah, I think he's going to be there in like three weeks into the season. Yeah. So, you know, and I think then Kyle Lewis goes to DH and you probably split Hanniger and, and Lewis with the DH outfield time. Yeah, like, that's crazy. That's crazy. I love that. One other move I would love to see them make, though, to be honest, is I would love to trade one of those Fraley, Trammell, one of those guys for a defensive minded Brett Phillips type fourth outfielder. So just in case late in ball games, you can go throw a defensive stud out there in center. Uh, that's you've got it one. with Fraley. No, he's not a center field. He's not a plus center fielder. He's not. He robs bombs. Yes, that's great. You ever seen him that's rob great. him? He's flashy. That's great. They they need a, a fourth outfielder that's like a wizard defensively, a Jake Marisnik type. Maybe they can go get Stop. Christian Pache. I, <laughs> Jake <serious>. Marisnik type. <laughs> if you squint a little bit, he kind of looks like Harrison Bader. If you squint at Jake Fraley, like, and you're just like, but you understand, like Marisnik serves a purpose. He serves a purpose. What purpose? Fourth outfielder. What purpose that, did that, he serve with the Padres? And Fraley no, doesn't with the serve Padres. <laughs> For the Padres, the Astros, like you need a fourth outfielder. Like it's good defense matters. It does. It does, it does especially in the outfield. You want to turn those doubles into outs. Yes, Brett Phillips. Brett Phillips. I can see Brett Phillips. See, I, I care about the things that maybe most people don't care about. But bumps fourth up, Brett Phillips bumps up the fun differential for sure. But Jake yes. Fraley losing him dampers the fun differential. So you got to, you got to, you're give and take there. So Trey Trammell, he's so boring. He doesn't do anything for the fun differential. That's for no. sure. No, you guys, I like Trammell. All I just right, want never him mind. to stop moving. I want him to stop apartment hunting. Yes. I know. I do. I, I don't want him traded. I feel bad for him at this point. The guy's been passed around. It's 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 unfortunate. The Marlins would love Taylor Trammell. Feels like a perfect Marlin. Yeah, they'll yeah, I'll fit right in. We should end the pod with that. Yeah, more thank of those. Guys. Oh no, not thank you, everybody. First, go get your just baseball merch, people. It's in the episode description of this podcast. I'm rocking my just baseball t-shirt. We also have not gambling advice merch, hoodies. It's still freezing cold outside. Get your just baseball hoodie. Also, check out Arms Podcast, the call up now on the Just Baseball Network as well. He's going over all the prospects. He's going to do a Seattle Mariners prospect episode, right? Even though we kind of don't oh, yeah. it, but just because it's so freaking exciting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. can't wait. I can't wait. That system's so fun. System is so fun. So, we're going to have write ups as well about these Seattle Mariners on justbaseball.com. And we're going to have another episode later. You know, we got to interview somebody from the Mariners. We got to see if any of these moves make sense. I mean, who would say no to Chris Bryant on the Mariners? Maybe Gipoto might be Jerry Gipoto, the GM of this of this Mariners, might be the only person to say no to Chris Bryant because he doesn't want to spend any money, but we want him to spend money. I like shortening it to Gipoto. I think Gipoto. That's Gipoto. I do Gipoto. Like that. That's lit. <laughs> and go also give us a follow on TikTok and Instagram at just baseball fans. Anything else before we end the pod, boys? Nope. That's all I got. Well, with that, thank you, everybody.